So uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Ben Pink Dandelion. It's fantastic to have you here today for our interview. Been really looking forward to meeting you. Um, your your name was so evocative the first time I heard it and garnered a great deal of interest. I'm sure it does, and we're going to be asking you about that today. But um, you know, from your uh, background um, as a Quaker and a researcher, um, I've been really looking forward today to um, asking you these questions that we've got for you. So, um, Ben, if I can. Um, jump in at the beginning. Um, could you tell us when and where you were born? Good heavens. Um, <laughs> uh, I was born born in uh, Red Hill in Surrey, actually. Um, really? Okay, because I live in Sutton, so I'm just up the road from Red sure. Hill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I grew up in Purley. In Purley? Oh, my wife was born in Purley. Um, she likes to tell people that she was dra sort of dragged up in Croydon, and then I have to remind them that she was... she. We grew up in South Purley, and, and you and I both know it's very different. <laughs> whereas, whereas I was dragged up in Luton, so um, oh, I can okay. South Purley to Luton um, are very different. <laughs> so Redhill. So what was it like there in the nineteen sixties? Sixties, yeah. Um, well, I had a pretty sheltered uh, upbringing. So um, my my parents were, you know, didn't go out much. I just remember being around the house most of the time. I had uh, an older brother, but he was had already moved away. I, th I think the ma I think the major shift was my father died when I was um, eleven, and but he had already arranged for us to move to a small village near Carlisle. Uh, so that was a huge, you know, big big shift to go from you know basically Greater London um, to to this little village where most people were related to each other. Uh, and we were obviously the outsiders. We had different accents, and um, you know, and it actually took me about a year to really become bilingual in Cumbrian. And I mean, they they had trouble understanding me as well because I had much broader vowels, longer vowels then. So yeah, well, two two of my best friends moved up to Carlisle over fifteen years ago with their children. Their kids are the same age as mine, and now their kids, I can't understand a word their kids say. Okay. Um, so go up to Carlisle, so I can uh, I can picture where you moved to. So, what was the what what? How did that move happen? What do you remember about why you were moved from Leafy Surrey to um, a village in the middle of yeah. near Carlisle? Well, um, it was mainly because my father's health wasn't well, it wasn't good. Sorry. So, you know, the idea was the air would be better for him there, and unfortunately, he didn't make the shift. But we decided to go anyway. Um, which was a very brave thing for my mother to do. She knew nobody at all up there. Um, obviously recently bereaved, but in retrospect, it was a great, you know, a great place for me. And it was a kind of a new start. Um, and um, I, you know, I've been at a, a, a school in, uh, in Purley where, you know, fighting most days in trouble with the headmaster, you know, getting caned for various, things um, and then went to this other school which happened to be a Quaker school near Carlisle um, where suddenly I mean this was radical I mean you know people called each other by their first name um, there were girls uh, which I hadn't really come across before uh, it, you know it, it was sort of revolutionary and um, but as I say gave me a second start and I actually you know fared much better at that school it was really very caring Nice to be. Oh, wonderful. Now, in your in your writings, you've I think you've described your parents as strict and particular atheists. That's right. Yeah. My wife, I see. I grew up in a completely secular, non-Christian family. Never went to church. Mm -hmm. My parents all the time talked about Christians were just hypocrites. You know that standard fare that you get fed as a as a in a secular environment. And I didn't go to church till I was seventeen. Um, but my wife grew up in a strict brethren church so okay. she has memories of hats and lines mm -hmm. in the church and letters of commendation before being able to take communion and the most radical thing that she did that really upset her parents was when she got engaged got in, in started engaging with charismatic evangelicals so that was quite radical for her parents but uh, we're going to get to you becoming um, a Quaker okay. and a Christian so your parents are strict and particular atheists mm -hmm. like I, I tried to I mean it just conjured up ideas of brethren churches for me what um yeah. very redolent what, what did that look like for you Dave? Yeah. well I was, I was playing on that a little bit obviously in that phrase um 
but my, you know, my father was an intellectual atheist. He, he thought that religion, you know, caused more harm than good. Um, my mother had had a very difficult time as a young person. Um, her family had disowned her when she'd become pregnant. Um, and, you know, and there was a lot of Christian morality around. And I think she just found it very unhelpful and had a bitter personal experience of being turfed out of a home at the very point where she would need support. So when the vicar came in this, you know, this little village near Carlisle, and the, the, the vicar came to welcome us, I mean, she actually shut the, the, the door. I mean, it was really a very visceral response she had to anything religious. Um, about the only time the TV would go off is if, you know, when Songs of Praise came on or something like that. So there was a very, you know, it was very clear. I didn't have a particular problem with it. I mean, you know, um, I wasn't feeling religiously drawn in any way or didn't feel a need to explain anything in particular. It was clear to me that someone could be a moral person without the help of uh, religion. And, you know, I suppose in, 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 the, in the stead of that, there was a sense of, you know, needing to lead a moral life, um, but also a sense that I suppose life was very hard which had been my mother's experience. I mean, you know, numerous unhappy um, situations and three marriages and, you know, and then the death of my father, who had been, had been a very lovely marriage. So, um, but so this sense that life is hard and therefore you must try and maximize your pleasure as long as you're not doing harm to other people. So kind of what I've called an ethical hedonism. And so, you know, when it came to say, well, you know, do you want to learn to play a musical instrument? And I'm practicing these scales. And, you know, my mother said, you know, what, not that, you know, it's so boring, isn't that boring? I said, well, it is a bit. She said, well, don't bother with it then. So, you know, I mean, if I look back at it now, I mean, maybe a little bit light in a sense on perseverance or, but, but certainly, a, you know, there was a complete philosophy about trying to, you know, minimize suffering um and make life as as caring and as gentle as possible for for the greatest number but without religion but without religion mm. yeah so my parents were very non-religious um well anti-christian <laughs> i found out much later in life uh, that my father had actually been confirmed as a catholic mm. um but decided to call himself an atheist in his uh, late teens. But my parents were a bit more uh, sort of eudaimonistic. It was, you know, whatever makes you happy was the mantra. And I, I must admit, watching where that led them was quite self-destructive <laughs> and rather immoral in their, in their behaviours. So um, thank you for painting that picture of your parents. They sound... Um, delightful it sounds like you had a, a wonderful relationship with them um did you were you aware of any times when you had any vague interest in religion was it was it easy were you able to talk about things with them or did you have to avoid any experiences or questions that you um, had? i didn't really have any experiences or questions so uh <laughs> no it was all on, on that front uh everything went pretty pretty smoothly um and in fact, of course, later when I did become a Quaker, I mean, it was it was actually a great disappointment for my mother. She, you know, she, she like, where did, where had she gone wrong? Somehow she felt she'd failed me. But the, so the interesting paradox here is, of course, that they did send me to the Quaker school. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Why, yeah. why would they? Well, and and yeah, so they what they wanted, they were looking for a, a private school with, you know, to try and help this son who had really been quite troublesome down in Surrey um, and the choice was between a Catholic school in Carlisle or the Quaker school at Wigton uh, which is about 10 miles away so uh, and they they thought the Quakers would do me the least harm so in other words that they wouldn't be pushing the faith in the same way that perhaps the Catholic school would and both of them had worked for Friends Provident Insurance Company in fact they'd met there uh, which um, is a, was a Quaker company, so so they had a little bit of a sense of of Quakerism as a perhaps a, a you know at least a benign version of of religion in their in their perspective. Yeah. So culturally and ethically and morally, a a, a place to send you. Um, yeah. it sounds like a lot of uh, my friends over the years who aren't Christians that want their kids to go to the local Church of England school, um, and and uh, the more liberal. 
the church the better so they don't force religion on the kids but have some morals and ethics mm -hmm. um, for, for, for them thank you for sharing that so if, if you don't mind me asking so what was can i talk about the effect of your father on you you've, you've mentioned your mother um i know you know i've got I guess everyone's got their own uh, backstories. My father abandoned me when I was about 16, and it was, it was interesting. That sort of led to a spiritual awakening for me at 17, and um, mm -hmm. that's my own story. But um, I'm just wondering what, what was the, if you can, tell us what, mm. what, what must have been an awfully difficult time. What was that like for you, for your growth? And Yeah. Well, I mean, um, he, he was always, had been very busy with his work, even though he wasn't very well. He'd started working at home. Um, you would kind of arrange to have some time. So, you know, generally my mother said, you know, don't, don't disturb your father. He's really busy. And, um, but I do remember one time where I, I was, I was making one of these model kits and the glue that came with the kit where I'd got somehow started to eat the plastic. And I was absolutely distraught. And, uh, and, you know, and at that point I was allowed to go and see <laughs> my father, knock on the door. And he, uh, what my memory is of just, you know, huge amounts of love and care and, and a sharing of my pain. Uh, so I only have very positive um, memories. And what's interesting is that we would both, you know, when, when, I mean, you say I got on with my mother, actually we had a little bit difficult at times and I was a very awkward teenager and rude and, you know, and we're both trying to struggling with our grief, I suppose, in different ways. Um, but we would both invoke my father. So, you know, well, you know, if your father was here, of course, he wouldn't agree. And I would say, no, he would absolutely be with me. And so in, in, in some ways, if it doesn't sound too blasphemous, I mean, my father became almost like a, a, a God figure in the household, particularly when he wasn't there anymore uh, and would be invoked in that way. Um, and so there was this kind of tension sometimes with my mother. But the other side of that was that I was his son and therefore could only do good ultimately, even if I was a nuisance at this time, and was given a huge amount of sense of both potential, I think, and of confidence in my, you know, abilities. You know, you can do whatever you want to do, Ben. Um, you know, go for it. So, so you know, I mean, there's a whole horrible mix-up, and I think I didn't really grieve properly, I mean, you know, until much later, and I'm still, I still am grieving. But, um, but, you know, coming out of that as well was a great, a great sense of, of support and, and, you know, people wishing me well. So. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so you're at this Quaker school. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember that any of the teachers and the oh, yeah. impact they had on you? Any? Yeah, Lo lovely, wonderful teachers. Yeah. Um, so it's a Quaker school. Um, modern day Quakers have a problem with private education, or many of them do. And so there were very few Quaker teachers there. And in fact, the headmaster was not a Quaker, but imbibed and exhibited the Quaker ethos, you know, again. So, um, but I mean, two of the teachers were Quakers. I've been in touch with them as an adult Quaker. Uh, one teacher I'm still in regular contact with you know, really a, a wonderful group of people. I mean, this is a school that when I started, there was about 200 pupils. So small classes, small school, great deal of care. Um, you know, just a, a really a, a good ethos. Also a, a very mixed um, group of pupils, you know, international and, and people who'd been sent by local councils because they didn't fit in easily locally. So it was a very lovely, diverse group. Um, and you know, uh, we have really, really good, good experience there. Yeah. Wow. And you know, the thing when you're at school and people say, what do you want to be when you grow up? What were your aspirations <laughs> when you were, mm, well, remember any that you would admit to? Yeah. Oh, well, I was changing my mind every week. Uh, but my father had been an actuary and I was, you know, I had a lot of, um, a th a, you know, a great deal of thought about, you know, maybe going into, into that. That world and I you know probably did the wrong A levels as a result of that did lots of maths and and then physics to go with the maths and uh, that didn't ultimately work out very well um, but the other the other thought I had was to join the Royal Air Force and become a fighter pilot 
uh, and I think there's interest in speed and and, and technology, um, but also the pension arrangements were fantastic. You know, I could re potentially retire when I was 38 and I'd be okay. So, <laughs> so here we have a measure of of how light the, the the you know the Quaker influence was in some ways. I mean, you know, there was no. I mean, I, I was a day pupil. I went every day. Uh, because of the bus timetables, I missed morning assembly. Um, and so there was very little explicit Quaker teaching at that school. I mean, we had 10 seconds of silence before meals. But I mean, you know, one of the hallmarks of Quakerism is its commitment against war and the preparation for war. But there I was quite happily thinking about being a fighter pilot. So, mm. yeah. It's interesting, whatever vestige of Christian input you get. So we say I didn't go to a church till I was 17 of my own volition and but with religious education as it was in state schools I'm still surprised so my wife growing up in church you know she'll still say how do you know that hymn and all I can think of is there must we I mean there were I remember badly played pianos and assemblies at, at all the way through you know junior school primary school and, and I don't remember enjoying them or paying attention but some of that stayed with me to know these hymns because I didn't grow up in a church so it's amazing what what you do imbibe and what you don't um, sure. so what if there was little of that what what of the Quaker ethos do you think did impart itself mm -hmm. to you that you still carry today what what do you treasure the most maybe from that yeah thank you well um, when I look back I mean here was a school that was in such contrast to the one in Surrey as I said you know first name terms you know, people, I mean, obviously there was a, a system within the school, but a, a great deal of care from the teachers. There was no caning or anything like that, obviously. So, and this, and this real, um, I think, a, you know, a, a joy of being with young people. I mean, that's what I got from the teaching staff that, you know, we weren't a burden or a hassle, but, you know, the, you know, the, there was something really rich that we could all learn from each other being in this international community. I mean, I remember the day the Iran-Iraq war uh, broke out and, you know, we had friends who were both Iranian and Iraqi and, you know, for about a day they didn't talk to each other. And then they realized this is crazy. You know, there's something that transcends this kind of nationalism and, you know, and it's just little experiences like that were, were really formative, I think. Thank you. So you mentioned the REF and speed. We will come back to vintage cars and motorbikes at some Great. point. Great, lovely. I, I have a shared interest in motorbikes with you, so we'll, we'll come back yeah. to the speed. Um, so, how much do you think your Quaker education um, had any influence on your early British politics that we're going to get to in a minute? Okay. Well, um, possibly. I think I think it had a slower burn effect. I mean, if I if I can move on from school. I mean, the first thing I did when I left school was I, I um, cycled to India um, over seven months um, and would have stayed out a bit longer, but came back because my A-level results were such a disaster. And I had to come, come back and kind of sort something out, you know, and had my, my mother in tears, you know, you'll never go to university. It's going to, you know, it's, it's awful. And so, and actually then I went to work at Friends Provident insurance company in Dorking so again oh, okay I know the, in Surrey yep. know the building I've yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um and I, I worked there for six months and at the end of that I then went to Manchester uh to the polytechnic there and started a hotel management degree so that I mean from you know it was going to be an actuary and then I was you know then I was you know not going to be an actuary but um suddenly I was going to do hotel manager. I could invent myself in all kinds of ways. I could, you know, could see myself doing a whole range of things. Um, my middle brother had gone into hotel management. We, uh, you know, I, I did I loved food and things like that. So, you know, I thought, right, I'll get on this side of the, the counter and, um, and ended up going to Manchester where previously I thought I might end up in Aberystwyth. So again, then thrust into a big city yeah. environment. Gosh, and and then at some point in there, I'm not sure of the yeah. chronology. You go off and join an anarchist peace camp. 
yeah. and change your name. Tell me about the Anarchist Peace Camp. I'll come okay. to you in a minute. Okay. Um, well, just by landing in Manchester, I landed into the the middle of a kind of you know a hive of political activity, and so this you know being a student in Manchester was, and this was 1983-82, so you know it was highly politicised. And I went from being a, probably a notional liberal, um, you know, and got very involved in sexual politics and started to meet people who were, you know, Marxists and then was a, you know, Marxist Leninist and a Marxist this and a Marxist that and a revolutionary this, all, all in the space of a few weeks, you know, churning through these groups a little bit as in the, the Life of Brian film, you know, the Popular People's Front and the People's Popular Front. And, and of course, we didn't like any of the other people even right. though I'd just been one of those two weeks before. So you weren't there. <laughs> yeah. And after a year on the hotel management course, then was elected as a, as a sabbatical officer to the student union. So I had a year off and it was part of the way through that we'd occupied um, the administration building and, you know, making various demands. And then there was a vote and the occupation was off. And I was where I was it was with some people who said they were anarchists, and they said, "Well, why are we following the vote? You know, just because just because they voted, why are we doing this?" Oh, okay, yeah. So, so having made, you know, I mean, already I was at the edge of of wanting to carry on with a management course, hotel management. Um, but this then just kind of triggered. I, you know, so I left the course. Uh, I left the student union job because, again, it felt just too constrained as, um, by all these votes. And I mean, one of the things about an anarchists, you know, don't vote, uh, try and seek consensus. And also their, you know, I mean, that basic form of anarchist ideology is, is against having power over somebody. So there's also a sense of like them needing to share leadership um, and, and you know, no, no votes, no leaders. And so I gave up the um, student union job. And just at this point, I mean, this is the time of Greenham Common, women's, people, women's peace camp down near Newbury. But there was a new camp starting near Warrington, um, set up by anarchists, the People's Peace Camp of Burton Wood. And I just went to live there for the, for the next few months um, and embraced anarchism. And, you know, so, I mean, and again, you know, this highly sectarian um, ideology. So at the weekends, the Marxists would come along because they believed in starting the revolution through the workplace and they were working. And anarchists believed in withdrawing your labor from the labor market so the system would collapse. Everyone stopped working. It would, you know. And so they'd come along and say, oh, joining us at the weekends, are you? You know, you've, you, have you, did you take a vote? You know, did your leaders let you come? Um, so a lot of antipathy, you know, remember Spain, you know, your lot shot the anarchists before they shot the capitalists, and, you know, so I was, I was being schooled in a whole political ideology. Um, but interestingly, this group of anarchists were, were pacifist. Uh, so that, you know, the stereotype of the bomb thrower was, was, you know, that, so, you know, so what I was getting here was a little bit like the Quakerism I'd la later embrace because no votes, no leaders, and, and peace. So, um, you know, and it was all peaceful protest um, and, and debate that it was all right to... As you're describing it, I thought, that mm. I was, as I was listening, I thought, are you describing anarchists or are you describing a Quaker meeting? <laughs> in terms of some of those, those elements you, you've also just made me think of it, when you talk about sectarianism it sounds like a the kind of thing that i've seen happen between uh, radical anabaptists um and evangelical anglicans mm -hmm. <laughs> and how they how they, their relationship to the world and work um yeah. and those dynamics oh, yeah. so you're you're at this peace camp and is it here that you change your name yes so the one thing we all agreed to do, because I mean, one of the one of the problems with anarchism is is it's very individualistic because nobody should have power over anyone else. And we all had weird and wonderful haircuts. I had a, a kind of a Mohican or a Mohawk haircut, uh, pink, um, but I didn't want it to be violent, so I didn't spray it up. It just kind of flopped over one eye, and I could like you know see over one eye, out of one eye. 
Um, and we had we had arguments about whether we should cut the airbase fence that we were outside or not, and whether there's a right to break the law, whether there's a right to harm property. And then amazingly, though, one evening we all agreed to change our names. Um, you know, we'd have debates about diet, should be vegan, fruitarian, you know, but the name thing was a great moment of clarity, and we all agreed, I mean, probably about 15 of us that night, to change our names to something silly. Uh, to show that we changed our name and to protest um, against the way the father's name is always passed on. So why the father's name is patriarchy, capitalism, boom, boom. So, and we, I mean, I was still signing on. Uh, so I, have, I hadn't totally left the system. But I mean, that was my income as I'd go back into Manchester fortnightly, sign on. Um, and on one of those trips, I went, I went to the, uh, this lawyer and I, June 1984, you know, in the midst of the miners' strike, I become Pink Dandelion. Mm. And legally, Pink is my first name and Dandelion my second name. Oh, okay. So Pink and is it, first legally. Yeah. First. yeah. And it's just that um, at the time, I mean, I, I wanted to be called Ben. All my, all, I was Ben to all my friends, but I didn't know anyone. I, mean, I didn't know anyone I liked who needed my surname. So for the authorities, they could have Pink Dandelion. Right. And to my friends, I would be Ben. So. Mm. So you, I mean, was again one of the reasons I'm looking forward to talking to you. My um, last name is Clark. My father was very abusive, and I wish, mm. with hindsight, I'd actually changed my surname because of the abuse that I suffered. Mm. Um, I've actually taken on an old family name, traced my family tree, and there's Swan Clarks, and I and I mm. feel it's given me enough. I don't know. It has helped me have some distance, but without it, and I and I remember, you know, the difficulty of you know, of ownership with parents and relationship. So you, you've got me wondering, what, what did your mother make of this? Mm. You've got this wonderful father yeah. and your mother. How did she mm. perceive this? How did you explain it to her? Yeah. Um, just before that, you can change your name at any point you want to, Jason. Yes. <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, it's surprisingly and wonderfully easy in, yeah. in Britain. Yeah. Um, it's just telling everyone that takes so long. But anyway, so... Uh, um, but yeah, my mother was obviously very upset. She thought it was a direct slur or insult on my father. And as you know, um, and I, I mean, I, you know, I would go home rarely at these times, but I mean, when I did, I'd come back with pink hair. I, I got earrings, tattoos, um, you know, I was a vegan and then I was into raw food only. Um, uh, I'd had a vasectomy because I didn't believe in increasing the population, though that has another story later, which I'm happy to share with you. Uh, so, <laughs> um, you know, just a whole range of things, you know, um, it just, did, you know, wasn't really looking good from, from my mother's point of view. And one of my teachers who I was still in touch with said, well, she feels she's made an investment, but she doesn't understand the currency that the dividends in which is a very nice way of putting you know I wasn't turning out the way she thought I should turn out but actually you know it, it, I was becoming who I was meant to be so um and uh yeah she got over it though because then a Japanese film came out called Tampopo uh, which is actually Japanese for dandelion and this tickled her so much I mean she was an East End Cockney and you know always up for a laugh and you know and after that she just say oh hello Tampopo how are you doing today you know and just you know it, it got her every time so she so after that it became a bit easier and I think in the end probably the name was a bit easier than the Quakerism um, but, you know, but but yeah calling you know calling me Tampopo helped so. <laughs> if you could go back to a younger you mm. at that peace camp you do that thing. What would you tell yourself as a younger, a mm. younger man? Well, I think I have um, always followed a kind of sectarian path. I think later Quakerism would appeal partly because of that. But I think I'd, you know, I'd want to be a lot less confrontational. You know, we, we went along to the village fete and took, took part in the tug of war competition and let the rope go and, ch and chanted that competition was violence. I mean, things like that now, I think, was that really helpful? I think I would have liked to have been gentler with my mother unless, I mean, you know, we got into a kind of a war 
state over a whole range of issues. Um, you know, if you weren't with me, you were against me kind of thing. And a little bit like the anarchists and the Marxists. Um, and so now I have a very different approach. You know, I really want to be alongside as many people as possible. You know, I, I mean, I think one of the blessings of not having, a, you know, a, 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 uh, maybe not having a religious upbringing, but also, you know, having a privileged upbringing is, is that, you know, generally I trust people and like people and think and want to think the best of them. And that's often repaid. And, and I think in those early 20s, I was getting into, you know, kind of, you know, just being overly antagonistic. Yeah. Um, so, Ben, at some point, I understand in your story that um, you left the revolution behind, um, which I want to ask you about next. What, what you know, what what made you leave it behind? But you didn't leave your name behind, did? Um, so, mm -hmm. what 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 happened to move you in a different trajectory? But why did you take the name okay. name yeah. with? Well, um, so 1984 miners' strike. It felt like everything was possible. Um, we were on the miners' picket lines. They were giving us coal. You know, um, there were lots of coalitions. You might have seen the film Pride. You know, lesbians and gays support the miners. You know, really interesting, um, kind of unexpected alliances. Um, and you know, I felt this is this is it's all going to happen. You know, it was like you know, any time now. And I was arrested probably about eight times that year, various demonstrations, cutting the fence up in Warrington, but going down to London, being awkward. Um, and then I suddenly thought, you know, actually this revolution involves people giving up material comfort. And probably in Britain, we're too comfortable for the revolution to have a popular appeal. And, you know, it's sort of an ideological shift in my thinking. I think I was probably a little bit tired and burnt out some of the infighting as well was wearing you know between the different factions and um you know in, in the lesbian and gay movement if you were bisexual that was terrible and you know there's all kinds of oh, just difficult things and um so i moved down to brighton I, well the first thing i did is i thought right i need to work within the system now so i actually went to look for work because so i was giving up the anarchism and, and one of the one of the difficulties with anarchism, it's so individualistic. So once someone withdraws their labor from the labor market, then they get burnt out and then, you know, they go back to work and someone else withdraws. It's not organized in any way. Um, and we had a big row at the peace camp as well one time when someone copied someone else's haircut. You know, so we had weird colors and styles and, you know, I said, you can't have that. That's my haircut. And what, and what had happened, we'd gone from the possibility of being individualistic or, you know, having an individual take on things to a kind of almost a, um, a rule of difference. You know, you can't be the same as everyone. You can't share the same kinds of things. And I thought this is, this is you know, not, not working. So I, um, love of cars, uh, trained to be a chauffeur. And it's actually still my only vocational qualification. I have a chauffeur certificate from the British School of Motoring. Uh, so, and I went down to Brighton because Brighton was a little bit softer than London in terms of um, some of these divisions in, in the sexual political world. Um, and the sun shone in Brighton, which I, you know, <laughs> good. I've been, I've been, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got one of the most, you know, other than, you I think mean, Eastbourne has the most. Travelled from Leafy Surrey up to Carlisle when it rains all the time, and you yes. start, you've migrated your way south, and eventually end up. Yeah. On like the coast. <laughs> uh, and I worked for a show, as a chauffeur for a little bit, but I, I'd also, I also applied to go back to college, and um, whereas previously I'd said. I'm leaving college because they won't teach me anything that's worth knowing there because it's so wrapped up in the capitalist system. What I discovered in Brighton is that even anarchism was a, was a valid topic for study and, you know, and, and I had it, you know, so that was, that was positive. But at this point, I was then also start going to Quaker meeting. Oh, so at this point, were you segueing a little bit back to something yeah. you said earlier, were you still, uh, were you a convinced Marxist who was now going to work within the system? Was that how you saw yourself when you got 
Yeah, I think once you've been an anarchist, I mean, I'd, I'd finished with Marxism, I'd, you know, uh, ex-anarchist, I think, when, you know, you really become rather cynical. There's, there's not very many places to go. So one of the anarchist mottos is, you know, whoever you vote for, the government will get in. And, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a, I had a deep sense of despair about the, about the, you know, the political system. Um, obviously, we've still got Margaret Thatcher in power. We've got, uh, um, you know, all kinds of, you know, Falklands War has happened and, you know, lots of things that were really uncomfortable and discomforting. Um, and then, um, sorry, I've lost track there. No, sorry. I'm, you were talking about going to a Quaker meeting. So I was going to say, so you oh, right. commit the ultimate revolutionary act. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, I did. I mean, I mean, just, I think going to work was the big kind of selling out. So training to be a chauffeur, I mean, my, my comrades or, you know, say, you know, what are you doing, Ben? You know, I've been so committed to the movement and suddenly I was taking a, an almost opposite path, you know, going to work for the bosses in a servile job. Um, however, but I was looking as well for a, a group that would work within the system, that would change the system from within. And, and here were the Quakers, still no votes, no leaders, because and I can explain that if you want, but, um, and peace. Um, and yet trying to affect change, trying to affect social justice, but not in a revolutionary way. I mean, I'd, I'd been very involved with separatist politics where women and men would live separately and, you know, trying to support, you know, be allies to lesbian separatists. And I went, I remember, you know, going to a meeting of, of uh, a Quaker group and they were talking about working together against sexism. And I, you know, and I said, oh, this is, I think this is naive. But I mean, again, you've got that Quaker kind of a, a sort of almost a universalist love of the world and, you know, no desire to start putting people into different boxes in some way, not, not to dismiss their different experience, um, but to say, you know, together we can work as allies on this and we don't need to, you know, be so constrained by some of these political niceties. So it sounds like you've migrated from an anarchist peace camp to a Quaker peace camp. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you, I, yeah. yeah. And you're still an atheist at this point is is it is it it's the community activism and yeah. organization that you you remember yeah pro probably a optimistic agnostic um so i you know i mean i i there was something in the silence because quakers in britain meet in silence we have an hour of worship uh in some in in which you know during which anyone might offer some ministry, might get up and speak for a few minutes, but um, the basis is silence and stillness. And someone at the peace camp, interestingly, said, oh, you've got God in your eyes. Now, that, at that point, I took it as an insult. You know, I said, you know, you know, if I wasn't a pacifist, come outside and say that. But, um, but I think there was something that was beginning to, to work on me a little bit. But, but I was basically a, a peace activist who ended up at a Quaker meeting because there was a group of people with similar values. Um, and it was only a year later that then I had a, a dramatic spiritual experience that, you know, changed the whole lens of which I... Yeah, at. I want to ask you about that in a moment. I mean, but, um, I'm doing some reading of some books. One of them is called Not Doing, another book on silence and, you know, come from quite an activist tradition who's you know, like a lot of evangelicals discovering contemplation. And I remember I came across a piece of research recently that um, uh, that if you, they put a bunch of men in a room, men were worse than women um, in this instance. And if they were left for 15 minutes with nothing but their own thoughts or to deliberately get to have an electric shock, something like 90% of men would choose the electric shock. They literally could not sit with their own thoughts uh -huh. for 15 minutes, yeah. you know, and that sort of attention deficit that we, we, we have in our society. So I'm just, um, yeah, thinking out loud here with you. So in that, so you're in those meetings and you're in silence, mm -hmm. which must have been very different than the noise of the anarchism that you've you've told me about. What can you do? You have any recollections of what it was like being in that space with your own thoughts? Mm -hmm. Does that question yes. make sense? Yes. Yeah. I don't think it was so unusual for me, actually. Um, 
So A, the anarchism hadn't really been very noisy and we'd spent a lot of time sitting around, you know, often on our own or I'd be reading or something or, you know, just, I mean, we had all the time in the world on our hands because all we had to do was cut the fence or hold up a placard or something like that. Um, but the other thing is, of course, I'd been this avid cyclist. Um, so I'd, you know, been on this seven month cycle trip you know and a lot of that time was just on my own with my thoughts so this you know wasn't, wasn't really so unusual um and i found it very comfortable many people come to quakerism and they you know like the idea but the science can be really quite difficult and you have to kind of work at it and learn your way into it and but for me it was a very easy fit and a number of quakers would talk about coming home to silent worship you know finding something there what's interesting is it was very comfortable but it wasn't i wasn't understanding it in in terms of spirituality at all i mean i could see however that i joined a spiritual group and i mean i've got a i've seen a letter i wrote in 1986 you know saying you know you know we, you know people need to know what they're a part of you know anyone pushing for change or this that and the other you know this is a christian group and you know so i was, I was very contractual still and i think that that's a, something i was brought up with um so wherever i was as an agnostic or a you know um it, you know it wasn't for me to say that's where quakerism should be i was very clear that i was joining a group that had very clear and firm beliefs mm. if i can remember at the end or later and towards the end of our interview um i'm, I'm just i'm a, a minister of religion a church minister by by day and watching uh, was in a meeting this morning with the lockdown guidelines and having to innovate ideas for silent worship mm. um and, and i knew i was coming into this interview with you today i'm like i think this is the moment the quakers were made for yeah. yes. <laughs> got a lot to lot to tell us so i'll, I'll ask you for some okay. tips sure. at the end if i may um so thank you ben so you're so you're going through all of that and um and you kept the name Pink Dandelion. And can I, yeah, just as we segue out of this part of your life into the next bit, what made you, did it fit at that point? You, you didn't have any, did you ever think maybe I should change it back or to something different? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did think that very much. Um, so one of the other things about Quakers is that Quakers don't use titles. So titles are a way of differentiating between people and setting up hierarchies. Um, so, um, so I would go along to meeting and so that people tend to use both both names and they say, you know, welcome and, and who are you? And I'd say, well, I'm Ben. And they'd say, Ben, you know, we don't, you know, Ben, who are you? I said, well, actually, I'm not really Ben. I'm legally Pink Dandelion, you know, but you can call me Ben. You know, and they'd say, well, yeah, thank you, we will. Um, but, you know, as I got more involved, I mean, um, well, I think, first of all, there was a little bit of antagonism um, from some of the Quakers around this name. It was like awkward for them. One person said, you can call yourself what you like, but the problem is you make us use it. So, you know, there was some discomfort. And I think if there'd been a great deal of kind of, oh, yeah, Pink Dandelion, so what? Then I may well have ch changed my name again particularly as things with my mother got a little easier. But because some of the Quakers dug themselves in, as it were, and were annoyed or dismissive um, or said, you know, you'll get over these youthful whims, um, then I, I dug my heels in as well because I was still in that kind of, you know, them and us kind of place. Uh, so, and then after a while, I got involved and it was just much easier to keep it. The one of the things I did do is then within Quakerism, I get called Ben Pink Dandelion because it's been very much easier to know what to call me. I've, I've never really wanted to be called Pink. So people know to call me Ben, even though that's not my legal name. Yeah, so. with you. And then of course, fast forward to the internet. Um, so to this day, you must be able to go online for anything you register for and find that your combination of your name, email addresses and logins are um, all available, yeah? yeah? not necessarily so any lines in the world yeah there's they're up well there's i don't know if there's any others but there's people who've either picked that as a username or and then there's this band appeared in the mid 90s called the pink dandelions 
and I, you know, and uh, I've even got T-shirts with the pink dandelions written on from there, you know, with a gig list on the back. But um, and I, I contacted their agent, and they go, they said, well, we better speak to the lead singer. Here's his number, and I rang this number, and this person said, British Gas Sturchley, can I help you? I said, oh, well, actually, I was trying to reach the lead singer of the Pink Dandelions. Oh, yeah, well, that's me. Yeah, I just worked for British Gas in the daytime. <laughs> anyway, um, they just made it up in a pub one night and then later had heard that I existed. So, um, but yeah. Yeah, but I mean, Pink Dandelions, it is easy to find me. Uh, yeah. So. It's very memorable. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to get to asking you a little bit more about Quakers in a moment, um, uh, Ben, but just to ask you about their attitudes towards business and how it's part of worship, which I, I don't understand at all because I haven't really looked. And, and again, so if you could just explain generally what that is and how was that attractive to you um, okay. at this point? Right. So um, the business connection with worship is when we're doing our church business. We do it in a in an atmosphere of worship. So we're not talking about, you know, cabris and round trees and those, I mean those people would I suppose so right, okay. So so at the basis of Quakerism is the idea we can have a direct encounter with God and that everyone can have that encounter. So that and in a sense then we are all ministers. So we will have different gifts as as outlined in you know First Corinthians twelve. And, you know, for some, it will be vocal ministry in the silence. For others, it will be pastoral care. You know, others, it might be organizing the finances, um, doing education, whatever, you know, um, working with ref refugees. But with, there's a great sense of spiritual equality that runs through Quakerism. And therefore, with that, pacifism or, or you know, really the refusal to want to kill anybody will be told to kill anybody and so um uh you know an ongoing witness against war and the preparation for war and an ongoing witness for social justice so you've got a group basically who then don't have any clearly set apart leaders so there's no priest or minister uh everyone is a minister and so there would be a number of ways you could organize worship you know we could have worship say like the vineyard fellowship we could take it in turns to lead the worship um, or introduce the message or whatever but what the quakers in britain in the 1650s did when it really got going was saying right we'll just sit in stillness and silence and we'll see who is given a message from god to share and worship in those days was like usually at least three hours long so and there might be quite a lot that was given to share people had really vital spiritual experience and you know, felt very close to God. Now, today in, in Britain, we'll have an hour usually of silence and they, it may be an hour of silence or it might have three or four or five different short ministries in it from different people. Um, but that same kind of spirituality is, is, is there, the same kind of spiritual understanding that we can all have a direct encounter with God. So then how are we to live our lives? Well, Basically, we're to try to tap into that connection at all times, ideally live in that space and, you know, be attuned to what God is calling us to do. And I use the term God. Some Quakers are a little bit awkward now about the term uh, God. But um, so but that's the traditional Quaker language. We're seeking the will of God. So so. You know, for me, I'm, a, I'm, I, you know, I'm trying to seek the will of God in everything that I do. You know, so even agreeing to take part in this, you know, would I, is, was this the right thing to do? Or is it feeding some unhelpful, you know, aspect of myself or that kind of thing? Um, so when it comes to Quaker meetings, as they're called, making decisions, we'll use the same process. We'll go down into, our, into a deep place of silence and stillness and try and discern what it got what god is leading us to do so in a business meeting as we call them you know a typical example is you know we've had an appeal from this quaker group to help refugee work in south london you know so we're given the information we're given the question 
and everyone goes quiet. <laughs> and it, will, it, it must look a bit bizarre. And then maybe someone was, will get up and we have a clerk who will indicate that, yeah, that person can speak. And they'll say, yes, I, you know, I feel that this is the right thing to do. We should give, you know, hundred pounds or something. It may be that nobody else then says anything. It's not about seconding or voting, but the clerk will gain a sense of the meeting and will then write a minute in the meeting and say, and read it out and say, the minute is before the meeting. Does this minute reflect where, where the meeting is at? And um, it might say, we have received an appeal from Daddy Daddy, we agree to give 100 pounds. You know, that's, that's a fairly straightforward example. And we will then say, hope so. We, we hope that this is doing what God wants of, of us. Um, you know, we can't be categoric about that, but uh, you know, we're on this journey together, trying to seek and be led by the will of God. So, so basically every decision can, can, can be, like, be like that. And there's a, there's a humorous postcard that says, you know, I am, I am a Quaker. In case of emergency, please be silent. <laughs> yeah. And at any moment of crisis, I mean, where do we go? Well, we want to pray or we want to be with God. We want, you know, we want God's love or assurance or help. And so for Quakers, that, you know, Quakers in Britain at any rate, that will mean going into silence. So that's where we, that's where we find God most easily. And I, I know we're on Zoom, but I can see the God in your eyes. You're almost lighting up as you're talking. Oh, yeah. about it. The, I can get very passionate about this. Yeah, the, the joy of that. So, I mean, again, very different experience um, than, mm. than my, my church one of many. So, yeah, I'd be just if I tease that out a little bit with you, so I, I can I can imagine how, you know, that's, you know, wonderful acts of consensus and group discernment together it must be quite stunning at times it must also be frustrating at times which i guess must be built into the whole spirituality of it but um what, what are some of the limitations to that process for you that you you, you know you live with like all church traditions we live with don't mm -hmm. we at some yeah, point sure so it can be very slow so if we're not finding unity then we would say we're not finding the will of god and so you know but and unity doesn't mean unanimity, but it does mean a clear sense in the meeting that this is the way to go forward. So there may be someone that says, no, I don't think so. But the clerk will say, actually, I think the sense of the meeting is this. And we are advised to set self aside. It's not about what we want. It's about what God wants of us. So we, we just, um, I live in Clitheroe and we've sold a meeting house, a historic Quaker meeting house built in the 18th century and moved into town. And the first question we had was, well, should we move? And some people said, well, we can't leave this lovely meeting house behind. You know, I first came to meeting here or I was married here or, you know, and other people said, no, we should really move. We need to be where the people are. And, and we didn't find unity very easily. So it, what happens then is the decision is postponed. And we wait and we sit with it and we'll come back again to that question. And what helped us through there was actually changing the question slightly to not would, you know, should we move, which is a, is a kind of personal question. You know, do you want to move? But uh, what will be best for the future of our community in the Ribble Valley? And at that point, it was much easier to set self aside and say, OK, what's actually best for this meeting? Well, having a historic listed building that takes up so much energy and money and is remote and we don't act, you have to be a really committed newcomer to get through the door, you know, or we could be in the town center with an accessible, warm, welcoming building that's visible and do things in the community. I mean, then it was, we found unity really easily. So it can be slow and it can be frustrating. And I sometimes have to remind myself that we're all part of this priesthood and we're trying to do our best to discern. And that helps, you know, me with some of the frustrations I sometimes feel. Mm. It's very helpful. Some of the conversations I have about charismatic worship or, mm -hmm. you know, I can talk about mediation and our own liturgical traditions and, you know, and how things work. But sometimes you find yourself going, it's just the way we do it. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. <laughs> it's what makes us who we are. 
mm-hmm. um, in some ways, you know, and there are, um, so thank you for letting me uh, uh, yeah, no, take that apart with you. So it sounds like that the clerk of the meeting is a very important role. I, I would imagine to be able to articulate that consensus. Yes, it's a gift as well. Um, so we do rotate roles every three years. Um, sometimes more frequently, and there's usually a maximum of six years at any one, you know, stretch. Um, but some people are brilliant clerks. Uh, they're very good at um, setting their own self aside. I mean, they have a, you know, the the body is trying to discern, and they are helping the body discern. They're needing to to discern who to call, uh, who will speak next. Um, and to when to write the minute and when to present the minute and what to put in the minute. So it is a great gift. Um, and uh, but, you know, again, they, they're known as the servant of the meeting. It's not a you know, it, it doesn't set up a hierarchy. They have responsibility rather than power, I think, is, is a helpful way of thinking about it. Um, in the in the way that the treasurer does as well, they have responsibility to, you know, look after the money that, you know, they're not telling the meeting how to spend it. Mm. Mm, thank you um so yeah moving to asking you some more questions about quakers so -hmm. that we can better i can better understand them and other people listening can better understand them um i uh, teach a doctoral program for portland seminary which is part of george fox university in america uh, a quaker uh, Quaker in its, its origins and its ethos um, and some of the faculty who are friends of mine um, are active Quakers, evangelical mm-hmm. Quakers um, and I do and some of their anecdotes that they tell me of you know being in a meeting and someone speaking and then how someone else would stand up mm-hmm. uh, in silence as an you know like I don't like what sort of I, what I heard was I don't like what you're saying and, then, and you're in a lot of trouble if two or three people stand up <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> but that was again just made me think of you know again how different mm-hmm. to my uh, mm-hmm. uh, Christian experience that is so I know enough Ben, to know that uh, the Quakerism that I've bumped into in the US evangelical Quakerism is different than the few Quakers I have bumped into with the meeting houses I've seen in the UK. And, and, and again, I, again, complete ignorance can, can see an evangelical version in America, but see a sort of almost, I would, would perceive to me, a Unitarian um, almost Christological heart failure. Um, would, wouldn't sure that Jesus would be mentioned if I went to my local uh, meeting mm-hmm. house where I live. So um, could you g- give us an overview of uh, yeah. Quaker, I mean, impossible question, a quick overview. Um, mm-hmm. I know you do in the Swarthmore lecture, but um, just where Quakers came from and how we ended up with the, the differences okay. and where the UK is at the moment. So until the 19th century, there was a single tradition, um, worshipping in silence, Uh, went through different theological emphases and in fact in the 19th century became generally evangelical but in Britain maintained uh, the silent worship method Um, and friends as Quakers are also known friends felt that the the silence helped them understand scripture better so they were fairly I mean so I mean one of the things I suppose that marks Quakers off is this reliance on the direct leadings of God. So so scripture has never been central in the Quaker tradition until we get to some of the groups in the 19th century. So how do we know what is of God? Really important question for any religious group. And for the Quakers, it was through spiritual experience, not through reading scripture. And what happens in the 19th century is that, first of all, was some people that start to balance the two, say, well, we need we need to read scripture and we need, you know, direct revelation. And then some Quakers then just move into scripture and really start to uh, question the legitimacy of direct revelation. How do you know it's not just your imagination? You know, a leading from God might just be what you want to do anyway. You know, and I mean you know that is one of the things we have to be really careful of you know i mean i you know talked a bit about motorbikes and if i you know see a motorbike say oh you know that's it's a sign i'm meant to have that you know and 
the, the people who are wiser in my household than me, which is everyone else, will say, you know, Ben, you often see signs when you want to. You know, it's easy to imagine a leading from God. So, <clears throat> so what we get in the 19th century is a development of, I mean, there are schisms and separate traditions of Quakerism begin to emerge. And put very basically, there are three kinds of Quakers in the world today. There's an evangelical tradition. So within that, there are then variations. There's a conservative tradition, and conservative in the sense of conserving the traditional insights, clearly Christian, but, um, but with the silent worship method. And then the kinds of Quakers that we find in Britain who would be called liberal Quakers, um, who uh, have really embraced this idea of, of spiritual experience being the primary authority, but in, in so doing in the 20th century have diversified to the point that, that many would, would no longer frame their spiritual experience in Christian language. So I have talked about British Quakers being post-Christian in that there are very many people who you know, it's not the language they use. They don't, they might talk about God, but not necessarily about Christ, or they might talk about the spirit, but not about God, and not about Christ. You know, Jesus might get mentioned, you know, as a historical figure or as an ethical teacher or a spiritual guide. Um, and some of this is to do with, you know, being worried or being concerned how other people see them. If, you know, if someone says, well, uh, you know, I'm a Christian, will it or i'm a christian quaker will it be understood in the way that that quaker means because obviously we have there's a lot of things about quakerism that are very different we don't have outward sacraments we don't have outward uh, priesthood um, we don't have separated buildings we don't follow the christian calendar um, because one of the things about this early quaker experience is that it was you know in all places in all times for all people and early Quakers understood this as the fulfillment of the second coming. It was the end of the book of Revelation. Now we've got some of that apparatus absolutely still in place. You know, there's no way we're going to have outward sacraments in, in Britain, British Quakerism, um, or a separated priesthood, or, you know, and meeting houses are not particularly sacred or special, and no day is any more special than any other. Um, and we're not using titles still. We're still not swearing oaths and things like this. So, um, but, uh, you know, but the second coming idea has fallen away and that's basically become a kind of a, you know, its own tradition. Now, just to go back in the world, in the world picture, the silent tradition Quakers, as you might call them, are now only about 10% of Quakers in the world because the evangelical Quakers, people like your, colleagues at, in Portland, uh, friends of mine in, in Portland as well, you know, those, those kinds of Quakers, because of their evangelicalism, have become more missionary orientated, and therefore the numbers have gone up globally. And we've got global Quaker mission in the 20th century. And a third of all Quakers in the world are in Kenya, large numbers in Bolivia. Now, I haven't heard what will happen though still in the pro, so sorry, in the evangelical tradition, we then get the introduction of pastors um, from about the end of the 19th century. Uh, and what, what we would call programmed worship as opposed to unprogrammed worship. You know, there is an order of service as you go into a friend's church. Though I've seen a pastor throw it away under the leading of the spirit and say, you know, I, I'm feeling really called that we shouldn't, you know, we should do this now and it's not what's on the sheet. Um, but still in most of those uh, services, um, you will have a period of silence or what might be called communion in the manner of friends, a period of open worship, of trying to, you know, regain that sense of intimacy with God, you know. And for many evangelical friends, all the music and the message and, and the, either whether it's hymns or choruses or a handbell choir or whatever, that's all to help get us closer to God. So in my, my view, and I've been very privileged to travel amongst friends globally, a lot of, you know, uh, you know I think actually there's less dissimilarity than, than at first appears. It might look like, you know, 
their poles apart but you know there's still this sense of direct encounter with god that we want to nurture through whatever worship method works for us the best um, and we still all of these quakers do their business in the same way in the way i just described still without votes trying to discern you know what god wants of us and all are committed to social justice um you know and and trying to maximize world peace so you know um i haven't heard of people standing up if they don't like a message that's interesting maybe yeah must be um, in the specific but if, if, if there's a, if there's a lot of people speaking someone might stand and not say anything just to keep the silence for a while uh, and i, I mean a, you know, most Quakers now are coming in as adults. It's 90% in Britain are coming in as converts. And of course, in an evangelical Quaker service, many people will come in from other Protestant denominations and not necessarily understand the, the, the differences. You know, there's a pastor at the front, there's a message, you know, there's no outward sacraments, but that's maybe not so unusual. Um, it may even style itself as a community church. And you then have a period of silence and it looks like this is the moment for prayer and testimony. And in fact, for that silence to be silent would might be a sign of a lack of faith. And so some people will want to fill that. And, you know, it's almost we need two silences in program worship, one for prayer and testimony and the other for communion. Um, but, you know, that's that's in another tradition from mine. So. Oh my goodness. So many things I wish I had time to unpack with you. Yeah, sorry, I'm no, no, this is fascinating. <laughs> so I can um I'm just connecting with my own research and um so so I can see a Quakerism that emerges with a rich and known tradition and understanding of scripture for its imagination into these contemplative practices. Fast forward 150 mm -hmm. years. And you and I both know that um, our imaginations are always substantively formed by curriculums of habits and practice. And mm -hmm. it's one of the things that I have looked at is why. Uh, so I was fascinated how evangelicals obsessed with the epistemological for believing correct things. Meanwhile, a bit like Charles Taylor would help us understand socially imaginaries, the habits and the practices for everyday life in consumer culture are what actually shape their mm -hmm. reflexes and responses so that when they as good protestant evangelicals want to hear directly from god he always does tell them to buy that motorbike or yeah. um, where does that come from mm -hmm. <laughs> we're, we're not you know yeah. god does speak to us but he is mediated th even through our imaginations and so i wish i could have time to yeah. unpack all of that with you today well, one, yeah one, one of the one of the safeguards within quakerism is that we are advised to test our individual leadings in the group so in a bit, in, in a little bit of the way I've joked in the house, you know, I say, oh, that motorbike, it's tested. And the others say, no, if I had a really strong sense of, of something, you know, I would need to take it to my meeting and corporate authority would complement my own sense of what God was asking me to do. And that's one of the safeguards. And I mean, a lot of people are attracted to Quakerism because it, it does offer that you know shared way of trying to lead an alternative life you know I, someone once said to me you know i'm i'm here because there's other people as weird as i am in this meeting you know and I, and during the week when we you know when we're on our own you know faced with the temptations of the world you know i can i can hear those voices saying you know no don't don't go for the latest gadget or the new upgrade or the you know um and so we are helped in our community and there's a rather unhelpful kind of myth that you know quakers are really good people because of these you know people like elizabeth fry and all these great pioneers of social reform um and some people say well i don't like to say i'm a quaker because they expect me to be so good but actually i mean my take on this is that we're quakers because we're not good you know we actually need each other we need the community of faith to you know to help us lead the life we want to lead and oh, so you know yeah go take a, a yeah well, i've been asked lots of very personal questions here today thank you for staying with me on them so at some point you go to america mm -hmm. and this winding back our conversation you talked about being hopefully agnostic or mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in some way but something happens to you could you tell us what happened to you in america in terms of what 
the, the spiritual experience as, as it was. I don't want to put words in your mouth if you tell us in your own words. Sure. So um, I'd been doing some study on the East Coast in the Quaker colleges there. Um, and just to follow up that previous question, I should say all the kinds of Quakers we find in the world are also all in the USA. So we will find evangelical, conservative, liberal, or, you know, in different geographical regions or overlapping. Anyway, uh, and I then took a bus trip to San Francisco, um, both because that was a kind of mecca for me, but it was also my own Jack Kerouac on the road kind of homage and, you know, and I had a, had a bus pass that could let me go on any bus uh, with a company called Trailways, which doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, I went out to San Francisco, I came back. Um, I was, you know, it was really fantastic. And on the way back in Denver, um, we re it, it was Labor Day, September. Um, and um, what happened was that the bus timetables suddenly changed after Labor Day. And I was found, finding myself with a 12 hour delay. Um, and I knew then I would not get back to New York in time to catch my plane. So I was you know, suddenly in crisis. I needed to go on Greyhound who were leaving in an hour. And I went round the bus station begging. Mm. Uh, I've, you know, using rather crass uh, phrases like, I'm a Quaker, you can trust me. You know, I'll, I'll pay you back. Um, but anyway, it didn't, a Quaker didn't, always pays his debts. Oh yes, but it didn't didn't seem to work actually. So anyway, um, but eventually I found a British student who said, "Okay, yeah, you know, we had enough reference points," um, and he and he bought me a ticket on the Greyhound bus, and I gave him every dollar and cent that I had uh, as a measure of my goodwill. So I was faced then with about three days of bus journey with, with no money. Every time the bus stopped, I'd just go and, and wash and do some self care, you know, and just, and, and I had fasted quite a lot at the peace camp. So it wasn't again, so unusual. Um, and I was okay. I mean, you know, I was going to catch the plane. It was good. Um, but outside St. Louis, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, I suddenly had this really tangible physical experience of being lifted up and held and just being assured that everything would be okay now that you know um even as an optimistic agnostic this was really rather bizarre um it was unbidden i hadn't been in a desperate place or you know praying or asking for help and that for me made it legitimate you know, this was not of my imagination because suddenly this has come from nowhere, you know, and the only words I had for it with that because I hadn't had a Christian upbringing was a really simple idea. Well, this is like God. I mean, this is God. And of course, I did have my understanding of Quakerism. And from that moment, Quakerism suddenly made absolutely more sense. It wasn't just some kind of contractual. Yes, I'm part of a Christian mystical group. I mean, you know, suddenly worship was about connecting or maintaining that connection. Business was, you know, meetings were about drawing on that connection to try and find the best way forward. So I then became, you know, very committed and, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm still a bit of a zealous convert in many ways because, and I talk about having, you know, the privilege of an accompanied life, you know, that that sense of, being close to God has never left. Um, and at times I've not talked about it very much because it's been awkward for other Quakers. And now I think, well, that's both letting that relationship down and it's not helping all the people for whom it is helpful to hear it mentioned. And one of the things British Quakers aren't very good at is talking about their spiritual experience. We're not very practiced at it. We, you know, we sit in silence and then we have coffee and talk about something else. And so it feels important to, mention that as a foundational moment for me uh, but it has been the start of what i say is an accompanied life mm. so what was the first time you went to a quaker meeting and worship like after that experience were you longing well, i was you know i had god in my eyes then i mean you know I, was, I mean of course one of the paradoxes of quakerism is that when it's really working we're filled with the holy spirit filled with this amazing sense of connection 
and yet we're all sitting there really quietly perhaps uh, you know i mean it's like having a pentecostal meeting going on but on the inside and when I mean, anyone coming in i mean it looks like everyone's either half asleep or you know and someone will offer ministry we don't react to ministry we will sit with it and you know if, if there's a danger in modern british quakerism it's become it, it's become rather rational you know we'll think about things a lot and we discuss things a lot or we'll write about things in really very wordy ways um which isn't really always very helpful we're not very good we're not as accessible now i think as we were earlier on and we're not speaking with our hearts as much as i'd like us mm. to so you've referenced god you've referenced the spirit so where mm. where is jesus for quakers and where is christ for you in, okay. in all of this journey yeah so as I mentioned, Jesus for Quakers is um, is fairly safe and and you know may not be mentioned very much, but um, you know would would be seen as I mean I asked a question on a survey of Quakers whether Jesus was an important figure in people's spiritual lives, and probably forty percent said yes, but thirty percent said it varies. So on any one day it could be seventy percent. And on another day, maybe 40%. So it's still quite a lot for whom Jesus isn't really very central for them. They've got other ways of expressing their spirituality. They've perhaps come from other traditions like Buddhism or, uh, you know, there are Hindu Quakers, there are Sufi mystic Muslim Quakers. Um, so the silence allows and accommodates a really wide range of theology. And there's no set confession of faith in that silence so there's nothing we have to say we believe in or that we're experiencing so for me personally my sense of god has changed a lot so initially it's like ben whatever you want to do i'm right with you you know really supportive kind of you know and i mean that probably lasted about eight years or so and then i had a I had a, a motorbike accident, but various other things were not going very well. And I had then a sense of God saying to me, look, Ben, you know, this isn't actually working out very well. You're doing whatever you want to do. Um, you know, listen a bit more. And so for me, um, obedience is a very important term for me, you know, discernment and obedience. But one of the hallmarks of British Quakerism is it is this very broad landscape and a sense that none of us have actually finally got there. We don't know the final word of God. We don't know the destination of our spiritual journeys. We haven't got it all neatly taped. If anything, we're a little bit cautious and suspicious about people who think they have. So that can be ecumenically, that can be interesting sometimes, you know, but but basically for British Quakers, we're on a spiritual journey. And we're very perhaps about our theology, almost in a dogmatic way. You know, we, we're only ever towards. So I might say, well, for, for, for me, obedience and diligence and discernment are really important. But there's no way I would go and tell another Quaker, well, this is the way God is for me. That's the way God must be for you. Okay. And, that, and that's why I'm a liberal Quaker, because I'm, I'm you know, I, I don't have the answers for, for other people. I have a lot of answers about what I think Quakerism should be doing to try and nurture the spiritual journey. But I don't I don't, you know, have God on a tape. You know, and we, we don't have a, a, a vocal creed, you know, a verbal, you know, any kind of creed of confession. And that's part of that sense of not wanting to be complacent about the, the nature of of the spirit i've evaded your question totally so i mean christ has come in and out for me i mean one of the ways i understand quakerism is through reading scripture because that helps me understand the tradition so much more because quakerism is essentially a christian tradition and i now understand the quaker attitude to communion because it says in first corinthians eleven twenty six, break the bread till the lord comes again well for a whole lot of Quakers, the Lord has come again inwardly. And so we don't break the bread. And George Fox, the founder of the Quaker movement, um, along with other people like Margaret Fell, said, well, our communion 
is Revelation 3.20, which is those who hear me knock, I will come and sup inwardly. And there's that sense of inward communion. So not outward communion. So it's not that Quakers aren't doing these things that other Christians are doing, but we're doing them in very different ways. And that's often misunderstood both by some Quakers and by other Christians. Mm. As all Christians misunderstand their own traditions <laughs> and don't know where Indeed. they came from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thus was it ever so. Um, thank you. So um, I can. So I got you in the story. We've got you to America and studying. Yeah. So somewhere along the line, you stop being a chauffeur mm -hmm. and at the Quaker meetings, and this interest turns into study and education. So you go. You come yeah. back into education and the study of Quakers. What 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 was happening there, Ben? Okay, so yeah, I I so I changed my mind about education and because partly because I found you know went up to Brighton Polytechnic Library and there's always books about anarchism and I thought wow so everything is valid within academic study and that you know that changed my mind so I actually then went part time and did a part time degree at Brighton Polytechnic. Um, in combined humanities, I studied media and history and religion and culture. And again, met a wonderful group of teachers. Uh, you know, this was really a stunning course. I mean, just, just fantastic, very collaborative, uh, again, very nurturing. You know, again, I went in initially with pink hair and covered with badges and, you know, they just stayed with me. Um, <laughs> and then because I you know, had such a positive experience there, I then decided to do a PhD at Brighton Polytechnic uh, with um, one of the uh, staff there, Roger Homan, a professor there, and um, ended up studying the way in which British Quakerism stays together in spite of this huge diversity of ways of talking about belief and spiritual experience. Um, and so then, you know, still wasn't necessarily looking for an academic career, but towards the end of that period, my mother died. And that, and then a Quaker job came up that I, appealed to me. And I went to work at the Quaker offices in London, uh, helping coordinate adult religious learning uh, through, through what we call a yearly meeting, the Britain-wide organization. So. Mm. So when you were doing your academic work and you press into sociology and history, firstly, was, was that unusual? Was anyone else doing that about Quakers? Were you plowing your own individual furrow? And, mm -hmm. if, and, and even if you were, were there any specific Quaker thinkers who helped you? Mm, okay. That well, um, Quakers, are, uh, uh, British Quakers have a lot of academics within them, but there wasn't really anyone studying Quakerism academically. Um, that has all changed dramatically in the last 30 years. You know, um, uh, and, and, you know, I've been part of that um, kind of shift, I think. So there, there was a couple of other people starting to look at the sociology of modern Quakerism. But really, you know, um, and, and, and historians and, and some the and people doing historical theology. Uh, but certainly sociologically, there were just a couple of us who were starting to do this work in the 90s. And, um, and then what happened in, so yeah, so there weren't academic thinkers, but there were plenty of people, you know, with good, good, you know, good things to say. Um, and there had a, there was a history of, of some academic history, so uh, a legacy of some academic history. Uh, but one of the tensions for me was my supervisor saying, well, you're sounding too much like a Quaker. You know, I'd say Quakers seek the will of God in their business meetings. They're saying, no, they don't. They claim they seek the will of God. And actually, if we looked at it sociologically, you've got a voteless decision making process. That's the sociological take on it, with the possibility of a minority veto. Like if a large enough group are out of unity, then the decision isn't going to happen. So what I did find is that I needed to adopt two identities, one as an academic and one as a Quaker. 
and I am Ben Pink Dandelion as the Quaker and I am Pink Dandelion as the formal academic. So in stuff I've written, if it just has Pink Dandelion on it, that's academic. And it's me talking about Quakers as they. And the Ben Pink Dandelion stuff is Quaker, me talking about Quakers as we. Now, some of the, I mean, it may be a false dichotomy, and you know, that's breaking down a little bit within academia now. Um, but I, I was strongly schooled to stand apart from what I was researching. And so I developed these kind of Ben the Quaker, Pink Dandelion the academic. Mm. So was there any antipathy towards you being a Quaker engaged in academia? Because I know, I mean, things have changed a lot, like you say. So even in my own tradition, to be an academic charismatic evangelical was almost an oxymoron now it's becoming yeah. more mm -hmm. common and a bit more de rigueur um yeah. like theology you know, spirituality where academia gets in the way of spiritual experience was was there anything like that for you as, as, a, as a quaker any antipathy yeah. no not particularly because i think currently because there's prevalence of academics so almost it was the opposite that actually everyone knew the best way to do what i was going to try to do you know, and we've we've now done over the years like three national surveys of of British Quakers with a rather a long survey with great response rates, eighty percent response rates. But what we find is everyone is writing all over these things, saying, "I wouldn't have asked the question in this way. You should ask it in the other way." So um, yeah. Uh, so if anything, there's a there's a problem with you know too many academics. Um, yeah. Ah, well, one of the reasons there might be more academic study is what you have developed for your postgraduate studies and stuff. So I know that in the early 90s, you began an association with the Woodbrook Study Centre in Birmingham. So what's the, what's the history of the Woodbrook Centre and how did that develop into a place for postgraduate Quaker studies that you have developed? Okay. Well, uh, Woodbrook was founded in 1903 um, it's the, the site is, uh, you know, absolutely idyllic. It was a former George Cadbury home. It's set in 10 acres. It's the largest organic garden in Birmingham. Um, we now have 70 bedrooms there. And from 1903, it became a residential adult learning center for, uh, primarily for Quakers, but people would come from all over the world and all different faith traditions. Um, and until 1999, ran a term program. So people would come for a term or two terms or a year. And, 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 and since then has run a number of short courses, um, you know, weekend courses, week long courses. And then now is, you know, offering, you know, it's really becoming a global online learning center in the present uh, crisis. So it's been one of the, you know, probably the leading adult learning center for Quakers um maybe even globally uh for the last 115 years i went to work there um initially my 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 job for the yearly meeting was jointly with woodbrook so i was jointly employed by woodbrook and then when that job ended in 95 i went to work at woodbrook as quaker studies tutor so as the person who would do the quaker history and the quaker theology in the term time program um, and then after, in 1999, when we stopped doing the term program, by then I developed um, a relationship with the University of Birmingham to offer postgraduate supervision. And so we set up what initially was called the Centre for Postgraduate Quaker Studies and is now the Centre for Research in Quaker Studies. And, and that's just gone from strength to strength. So we have about 30 PhD students. Um, we've got a staff of 13 just involved in the postgraduate programs, supervising different areas of, uh, you know, theology or sociology or literary studies, uh, history of medicine, these sorts of things. Um, and we are now the leading research center in, in the world. And it's partly that growth of the center that's so supported the um, growth of academic Quaker studies. We have a, you know, referee journal, annual conferences. You know, there's a unit in the American Academy of Religion. So, it, and at the moment, there's a lot of new publications coming out as well. So, yeah, it's been a really, it's been a trip. Yeah. And totally unexpected. I mean, I wasn't, you know, not, never tried to look for any of this. I just uh, imagine, you know, a little thought experiment. If you could go back <laughs> to a younger you at that anarchist peace camp when you were, I say, here is where you will end up one day. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and I, of course, I would face... Yourself. 
yeah. I'd faced the accusation that I had sold out, you know, in a whole, yeah. all kinds of ways. And only the name probably remains. In, 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 in yeah. Sense. Well, thank you for what yeah. an amazing journey. So I'm sorry, you're doing really well, Ben. We're on the downhill uh, with final okay. questions here. I want to move on to the, uh, the in 2014, the Swarthmore lecture mm -hmm. that you made. And um, uh, I understand um, our producer for today, Simon, um, uh, has got a contact with someone who was present that it caused quite a stir your critique of liberal Quakerism um, so could you give us an overview of the background to the lecture and what you were trying to do when you were I presume you were invited to give a critique but maybe you weren't <laughs> well the the Swarthmore lecture is an annual lecture that Woodbrook again has uh, initiated and um, supported but it's held at the time of what we call the yearly meeting, the annual meeting of all Quakers in Britain. Um, so where typically, you know, over a thousand Quakers will gather, every Quaker is, you know, able to come to these meetings because the business belongs to all of us. Um, and it was held in at Bath University that year. Um, and we actually had two and a half thousand people come. It was, you know, more than more than usual. So yes, the committee would have discerned in the business process I described to you before, they would have sat in worship, they would have come up with a topic to start with, what would be a helpful topic for friends to reflect on that year, and then they would have discerned a name. And the yearly meeting was going through a three year process about what it meant to be a Quaker in Britain. And so the lecture committee thought, let's have a lecture that coincides with that theme. So I was invited two years earlier then to prepare a lecture on the theme of what it means to be a Quaker. And my first thought was, well, it's interesting that we're even having that as a theme. Do we not know what it means to be a Quaker in Britain today? And of course, I think the answer is, well, we're a little bit confused, we're a little bit uncertain. We're not practiced at sharing our experience. We're not um, always very good at then telling an inquirer, someone new, what this Quakerism is all about. You know, is it about values or is it about, you know, is it just silence or is it, well, you can believe what you like or, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of mixed and confused messages out there. So what I tried to do in the lecture was lay out what I saw as the essential elements of what it was to be a Quaker. But I also used my sociological research to, and historical research to show some of the challenges facing British Quakerism, such as the fact, as I mentioned before, 90% of us are coming in as adults. And when my post at the yearly meeting disappeared about coordinating adult religious learning, you know, we must be about the only church organization that doesn't have a systematic kind of education system for newcomers. You know, there's, you know, there's, I mean, there's no, there's not even a pastor to say, well, you know, read this or, you know, this is a, here's, there's no confirmation class or anything like that. Uh, everything is optional. And so we're relying on people finding their own way and, you know, uh, picking and mix, you know, uh, using a pick and mix system for, you know, which bits of education they want to engage with. So basically I was able to use those kinds of things. And I think what was probably unpopular is I did uh, talk about um, atheist Quakers and I said, you know, we can't say that we're seeking the will of God as an organization if for, for some of us there's no such thing as God. And I went back to my kind of more contractual sense that, you know, we should know what it is we're joining or participating in and we shouldn't necessarily try and change that. You know, um, we, we know, you don't join the hiking club and say, let's go swimming. You know, I mean, you know, you join the swimming club to go swimming and you join the hiking club to go hiking. And there has been a growth of what's been called non-theism um, in the last decades of, of Quakerism. And I think we've reached a much more um, mutually understanding place now. But non-theism is quite a awkward sort of idea partly because it's a negative but also it's a coalition of atheists agnostics and just people who find the term god unhelpful and there are probably very few you know 
uh, hardline atheists in, in, the, in the Quaker movement, but there are some. And of course, they're attracted by things like the peace witness and social justice, maybe even by silence. But they're not necessarily, um, well, they're not experiencing that as a spiritual reality. And so there's a difference from moving to where you have a, a diversity of ways of talking about spiritual experience, where the spiritual experience may be shared, to the point where actually you've got two camps, one who have experienced something of the spiritual life and others for whom that is not a reality. And I, I was fairly strong about that, particularly in the book version of the, the lecture. I mean, you know, and you can't please all the people all the time, but actually you feel you actually are saying something if you don't please all the people. So, um, you know, and I haven't really changed my view since then. If anything, I've become, you know, quite probably, you know, stronger in some way. Yeah. Well, during the lecture, you appealed to the to the red a red book. Oh yes. Not the thoughts of Chairman Mao. So I'm 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 understanding from our conversation today that Quakers don't have a don't have a creed or confession like a lot of our churches. But you have this red book, and it's um, does is it a state? Is there a statement of? Fa I'm assuming there's practice in there for meetings, but is there also mm -hmm. a statement of faith? Could you tell us what the what the red book is? Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly. So it's called the Book of Discipline, a book of discipleship. Um, it was the very first one was printed in 1783 and it's been revised in just about every generation. So the red book is the 1994 version. And before that, we had a 1959 blue book. And I'm now on a committee that's helping think about a revision of that. Well, we've been asked to revise the red book. And is that just for liberal that there are these three traditions is this book accepted in all the traditions no. this no. is just for britain just for britain right. so irish quakers will have their own have their own book so there are 70 quaker yearly meetings through the through the world and they will all have their own book of discipline right okay so within the liberal tradition you you know you, we could find probably you know 25 different books of discipline then we'd find you know 30, 40 evangelical ones, and then, you know, five conservative ones, that's a smaller tradition, but yeah. So. so if you know which Book of Discipline a Quaker uses, that tells you immediately the, mm -hmm. the stream of Quakerism that they're situated in, yeah? Yeah, sure. Though, I mean, again, I mean, I have an Irish Book of Discipline upstairs, so that I might use other books of discipline. Um, North Carolina conservatives are rather lovely. So, you know, um, you know, we, they're, they're, a lot of them are, are very wonderful. The British one is is mainly an anthology of spiritual extracts in its current state. Um, so lots of really helpful paragraphs on any particular issue. And again, not offering necessarily a definitive answer, but helping us think through difficult moral, ethical, spiritual questions. Um, yes, yeah, so I was waving the red book saying some people haven't even read this. Though I'd forgotten to bring it up, so I was waving a, a virtual red book. But uh, oh yes, yeah. in the video you were had an imaginary. Yes. So um, what what happened fo following that? And I'm not it, I'm not you know is that actually we did have a calendared reading of the red book prior to discerning that this it it did need revision. There were bits that appeared old fashioned or you know out of date. Now other other it didn't reflect, for example, our attitudes to sustainability um you know and these sorts of things so we, we the time is right to revise so with my other hat on i'll say well do we need why do we need a book i mean you know is it that somehow our spiritual experience isn't so vital now that we need to turn to a book for inspiration instead of you know to the holy spirit or to god so you know and we only get a book after 100 years of quakerism the first quakers didn't have a book because they're just filled you know, with this sense of uh, Christ come again. However, that's another. Does, does anyone another. ever suggest? Well, there is a book you could turn to. No, no. no. Uh, well, no, because that would be the book in the experience of the people that wrote it. Uh, so, whilst I mean, if you go into your meeting house, um, you know, in in Sutton or wherever, you will still find Bibles there. There'll be the Red Book, and there'll be maybe Bibles in different translations. Uh, and people will still reference uh, scripture, but 
but you know uh, for the early friends you know the word of god was the living christ and the, and the scripture is the word about the word so you know there's that kind of differentiation um and so you know certainly in britain direct revelation has always been primary uh, yes so ben time is running away with this i need to yeah, sorry <laughs> no it's just been so fascinating i wish we you know, have much more time and thank you for your uh your resilience with all my questions um i want to get things down to th maybe three last questions for you the last one will be about vasectomies earrings and motorbikes so we can okay. finish there um but uh you talked in the lecture about how the world runs on different values to the world of the spirit. Um, how would that apply to Quakerism politically? And how do, would you discern the difference as a Quaker? Mm -hmm. That question makes sense? Yes, certainly, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, some Quakers are involved in party politics. Um, you know, there have been Quaker MEPs, for example, and, and in different political parties. Um, but I think transcending that is this really strong, you know, concern for the whole of humanity. You know, you can't believe what you like as a Quaker and you, and you can't, you know, there, you know, it isn't an anything goes religion because you know, anything that would marginalize a portion of the population is, is not acceptable. I mean, that is a kind of fundamental spiritual truth, I think, for us as Quakers. You know, whatever kind of discrimination or prejudice is, is not acceptable. And it doesn't mean we're very good, because of course we're humans in our society. So, you know, we're not necessarily always at the forefront of, of you know, social justice work. We're trying to be there. We want to be supportive of it, um, but we're human. We fail, we learn, we need to learn. You know, at the moment, we need to know more about Black Lives Matter. There's very few uh, Black Quakers in the British Quaker movement. You know, why is that? And, you know, and, and what kind of barriers are we putting up with, you know, um, so what kind of messages are we giving out? But that kind of transcends the party politics. Is a kind of a spiritual ethic, a spirit-driven imperative to try and transform the world. So I talked in the lecture that we are transformed through our spiritual experience in order to transform the world. And, and, and you know, and that is the driving political dimension of, of Quaker theology. So, uh, I may have forgotten another part of your question. No, that's great. So my penultimate question then, you alluded to the sound of kettle drums in your lecture. Yes as if they were the essence of Quakerism and then quickly ameliorated it to, of course, that they'd be silent kettle drums, but you were, you still made some noise when yeah, you were yeah. acting it out. So what, what was, I just wanted to unpack that with you in that moment, because it was, again, it was like a moment when you were very alive and you were, mm -hmm. I could see this sort of reservoir of what Quakerism might mean to you or could be. What, what, does, what did that mean? It was, was it more than just a passing comment when you said the kettle drums? Well, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I think maybe because we, um, I mean, we still look back to the, the first friends regularly, the first Quakers. They still inspire us, even though they were a lot more certain and dogmatic than British Quakers would be now. But I mean, if I think about these ideas and about my own spiritual experience, you know, Here's, a, here's the sense that we can all have this direct encounter with God, that, you know, um, that we don't need anybody else, we don't need any text, um, and we, we're taken into this incredible and intimate place, you know, kind of a, a spiritual habitation where everything looks different and feels different, and where we will, you know, see people people as equals and hopefully treat them as equals whatever their age or gender or sexual orientation or you know different abilities and gifts that everyone is spiritually equal and worthy of our care and love and that hopefully we can be channel channels of god's love to the whole of humanity you know and that we're all ministers that we're all partakers of this we're all you know part of the holy nation you know i mean it's just powerful stuff you know, and so I do then go boom, 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 you know, I mean, that's, you know, it's that 
kind of, you know, I'd probably be very happy in your church, you know, except I'd need some silence in there. But, you know, that sense of outpouring of the spirit, you know, that's the kettle. That's just the symbol of, you know, that the kettle drums mean for me. We should be banging on about this. I mean, you know, and, and instead we're quiet. We don't advertise very much as, as Quakers. We hope people will find us when they need to. Um, and when they do arrive, we're really poor. And as I say, lacking in practice at explaining the power and the potential of what can happen in the silence. Mm. Well, you, you talk about silence. We do, um, some people are at my, even though we're charismatic evangelicals, that it, it is a Quaker antecedent that we have. We mm. wait quietly. And so some other charismatics usually find that disconcerting because the, where's all the noise? But we, uh, one of my friends um, who came to, became a friend, came to my church, left and went back to his American evangelical church. He said, I miss that bit. I said, what bit? Mm -hmm. He said, that bit at the end of the service where there's no music, there's no noise. Mm -hmm. We're just waiting in the presence of God. Lovely. Um, yeah. That's one of our, one of our wonderful heritages that we, I have Quakers to thank. So my last question, yeah. um, which I grouped here, is you you mentioned your vasectomy, and but mm -hmm. but again, if I use the word alluded, you said there was another part of that story. I wanted to ask you: you've retained your earrings, um, and um, do, do the ones that you have mean anything other than you like them? And uh, motorbikes, we've got to finish with. So, okay. um, which which of those three do you want to start with? Okay. Well, back in '83, I had this ear pierced, and that was a that was a sign of sexuality. Uh, then by 91, I was feeling rather conservative. So I had another four put up this year. Um, so, but, so I, I mean, we haven't talked about sexuality, but, um, um, you know, I, I, I found through my teenage years, I was bisexual, but didn't quite know where to put that. Uh, and initially then became very involved in the lesbian and gay liberation movement. Um, and then struggled with their, some of their, at the time, responses to bisexuals. And so, and then we formed bisexual movement, you know, and then a little bit kind of um, away from all that now in terms of, you know, um, politics. Um, and, but have also um, moved from a position of kind of uh, polyamory into monogamy. And that's been a really wonderful blessing in my life. And, you know, but part of that as well as be, being becoming a parent, which again, the younger me would never have imagined. So, and that is a great gift and blessing. And so that just wanted to round that off, that, you know, and a, a gift from God. I mean, you know, uh, two things. I mean, one is, you know, often we get what we pray for. Uh, and secondly, you know, there I am in 1984, so sure about so much. You know, and it brings to mind the same, well, how do you make God laugh? Well, you know, you tell her your plans. And so, so we never know what's going to happen next. And I've been so grateful for just an unfolding journey, um, you know, and yeah, lots of motorbikes, anything with wheels, you know, bicycles were my first love because they allowed me to get out of the village and, you know, then motorbikes, cars, back to motorbikes, now probably back to bicycle, fire prams back to bicycles so um, and no longer speed but just puttering along i've got you know 1973 moped oh, good <laughs> oh. well then what a what a absolutely wonderful place for us to finish it has been a delight to meet you um i just found your story so f thank you for being so vulnerable um and open with your backstory and um but just the way you've integrated that in the conversation it's helped me understand uh, quakerism um and, and i and I, I must admit at the end there when you got onto the kettle drums i could see i could see the god in your eyes and the passion again thank you for um for bringing that forward for us it's been a delight to be with you so thank you ben all right thank you it's been lovely to talk right. to you okay bye-bye 
We hope you enjoyed that, and we have many other interviews with amazing guests where we listen attentively and respectfully to discover people's backstories through their beliefs and life experiences and find out what shaped them into who they are and inspires what they do. You can catch all those interviews by liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can find audio versions in your podcast platform of choice, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, etc. Just search Extra ECC. Of course, you can go to extraecc.com and sign up for our newsletter and find all our social media links and more. And by the way, all links are in our show notes below. Mm -hmm.